it. Give me just a moment. Okay. Give me just a moment to pull it up. Okay, can you all see this? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. So there are um, three main scriptures for tonight. So if you want to write them down, I'm gonna go through this as briefly and succinctly as I can because there's a lot to cover. But as she said on Sunday, we were dealing with mental health and, and healing, but also we've been on this family matters trajectory, but also I wanna focus in on healing uh, this evening in alignment with Sunday. And so the scriptures that we're focusing on are the following, 2 Kings 5, uh, verse 5, and then verses 8 through 14. But I strongly suggest that in your own time, you may want to consider reading that entire thing, but for the sake of time uh, tonight, we won't. But 2 Kings 5, verses 5, uh, and then 8 through 14. And then the other one is in the book of John. I'll give you that later. And then the, there is a third one as well. So you all will see those briefly. So I'm going to read this out loud. Naaman is healed. Now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was considered a great and honorable man by his king. And he was highly respected. And he was a man of courage because by him, the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a fierce warrior, but a leper, he had a skin disease. He was truly a great man, but he was afflicted with the grievous skin disease. Verse eight, now when Elijah, the man of God heard about Naaman, he said, just let Naaman come to me and he shall know that there was a true prophet in Israel. Now Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stopped at the entrance of Elijah's, the prophet's house. Elijah sent a messenger to Naaman saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh will be restored to you and you will be clean. Now pay attention to this. But Naaman was furious and went away and said, indeed, I thought, that the prophet would at least come out to me personally to see me, call upon the name of the Lord, wave, wave his hand over my leprosy disease spot and get rid of the disease and heal me. Are not Abana and Parpar, the rivers of Damascus, better and cleaner than all the waters of Israel? Why can't I bathe in them? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So Naaman turned and went away in rage. The other version says angry, offended, and bitter. Then Naaman's servants approached him and said, my father, if the prophet had told you to do some great heroic or hard thing, would you not have also done it? How much more then when the prophet said to you, wash in the Jordan River and be clean, so Naaman went down and plunged himself into the Jordan seven times, just as the man of God had said, and his flesh, we're talking about healing, was restored like that of a little child, and he was made clean. Okay, now I'm going to read it in one more version. Pay, pay close attention to this. The king told Naaman to go find Elijah. So Naaman showed up at Elisha's door with his horses and chariots. Elijah did not show his face to Naaman. In other words, he did not come to the door. But instead, he sent instructions to, through his servant. Tell Naaman to wash yourself in the Jordan River seven times. The waters will heal you and your skin will be back to normal. You will be cleansed. Naaman boiled with anger as he left Elijah the prophet. He had come to the prophet's house expecting something different. Naaman said, what is this? I came here thinking that the prophet Elijah would come outside, call upon the name of the Lord, 
and that the prophet's hand would pass over my sores and heal my skin disease. Not that the prophet would tell me to go to the waters of the Jordan River, that Abana and Parpar rivers and Damascus are greater and cleaner rivers than all the rivers of Israel combined. In other words, he's saying the river that I would prefer to go to for my healing is actually cleaner. I, I, I like that route of healing better than the one that the prophet instructed me. So why couldn't I just go bathe in those rivers and be healed? Naaman then stormed away, bowling with anger. Later, his servants approached and spoke to him with respect. Naaman, if the prophet had told you to do something great, important, heroic, wouldn't you have done what he asked? Why then is it difficult for you to follow his simple instructions when he tells you, bathe yourself in the Jordan River and be cleansed. So Naaman swallowed his pride, walked down to the Jordan River and washed himself seven times, just as the man of God had instructed him to do. There, the miracle occurred. Naaman's disease was healed. His skin was as new as an infant's, and he was cleansed from his disease. Swallow, yes, yes, Shaquita. So again, for those who are just joining, welcome. This is 2 Kings 5, verse 5, 8 through 14. So I didn't want to assume that you all were uh, already familiar with the story. I had to go back and read it myself because it's been years since I um, heard that particular passage. But as we begin here over the next few minutes, I want to say that when you listen to that reading, it could be greatly misconstrued as a legalistic, like religious ideology of steps to healing or how to work for your healing, I want to say up front, this teaching is not that. Uh, and so in the conservatory, what we're taught to do is to press every passage under the finished work of Christ and the new covenant. And so when we do that, we see something totally different with this particular passage. This is not about a, a ritual steps or some type of religious steps at all, but it's really about honoring our own process of healing. This includes, of course, mental health, emotional health, uh, you know, physical healing, uh, relational health, however you want to put it. Uh, but the bottom line here is, are you willing to change your mind? Now, as we're reading this passage, I'm going to keep screen sharing off and on intentionally because I want you to see certain things. But as we were reading the passage, I became captivated, y'all, by two particular words. It captivated me. And I think that these two words that I'm gonna show you could easily be overlooked, but these two words um, may not mean much to some people, but it meant the world to me because um, I, I almost skimmed right by it and then I backtracked. And so if I had to title these few minutes, it would just be called, I thought, I thought. And I wanna show you where that is coming from. Here we go. Do you see in the purple here? Okay, but Naaman was furious and went away and said, indeed, I thought that the prophet would come out to personally see me and lay hands on me and that's how my healing would come. I thought. And if you look in the different versions, the other one says, I can't, what is this? I came here thinking that the prophet would come outside, call upon the name of the Lord and that the prophet's hand would pass over my sores and heal my skin disease. And so I thought, now uh, I just have a few points for you this evening, but uh, the first one is in found in verse 11 from this passage. What we see here is that our greatest enemy is not the devil, quote unquote, as we're often taught in religion. Um, our greatest enemy is often our own thoughts. I thought. And uh, it's really interesting because when you examine the passage of Naaman, 
And you see here how there was a word for him and uh, that contradicted the way that he thought his healing would come. But the moment that Naaman said, I thought this is the way that my healing would come. And then the moment where he had a different thought and decided to comply and go into the Jordan River, that is where the entire narrative shifts. And so the bottom line here for our first point is that, again, our greatest enemy is not the devil. Oftentimes it's our own thoughts. And it's really interesting because this is why we have in this, new, in this day now, the mind of Christ within us uh, and is really, really powerful because we can surrender our uh, conditioned thoughts, how we thought our healing would look, how we thought the story would go, how we thought our journey would look. We can surrender all of that to the mind of Christ. And um, so what's very fascinating to me is that when we envision a certain way that our healing would come, whether that be mental, physical, relational, um, and we get into our minds sometimes that in order to get to X, Y, and Z expected end, uh, then my healing or my process or my journey has to look this way. And this was brought up on Sunday as well. I believe that a few people even gave some examples about how they thought God would heal, come to find out there was an entirely different journey that the Lord took them on uh, to experience uh, the, that healing. Now, we know that um, through the finished work of Christ, we are already healed. So we established that. But uh, the second scripture here, I'm not going to read it this second, but if you can just write it down, it's John 15 and 3. And many of you are familiar with it. It simply says that we are already cleansed because of the word that God has spoken to us. And so um, this passage really, really, really made me consider what I thought. And how many times I thought that if I ran around in church till my wig fell off, that I would be healed. How many times I thought like Naaman, that if the prophet just came to lay hands on me, then I would be healed. How many times I thought that if I fasted until I was a toothpick, then I would be healed. And there's all these different um, nuances that religion teaches you about how you can work your way into the space of healing. Um, and so it's really, really important that we begin to challenge our own thoughts and, and how we thought that our journey and our process would look. But what's even more fascinating is that the reason why we read this twice so that you could see it through a different, uh, different lens, um, through the different wording, was that Naaman was actually um, offended. Different versions say that he was offended, he was bitter, he was, uh, he was salty, as we would say during this time. Uh, he was offended. Um, but I'm getting to a place in my life now, and I just thank God so much for the conservatory, to where I am not um, insulted to give up what I had in mind. I'm not offended anymore when my journey takes a detour from what I had in mind, when my healing process does not look like I thought it should look. Why is it, I wondered, was it that, you know, Sister Watermelon and me prayed the same prayer together, she received a miraculous healing and I had to walk my thing out. Why is that? So those kind of questions are normal for us to experience sometimes uh, about what we thought, what we thought our journey would look like. And so it, it's really crazy because Naaman said, what? The prophet could have at least, instead of sending his servant to the door, the prophet could have at least came to the door himself and laid hands on me. And I just said, wow, how many times in religion have I thought that? Have you thought that? Maybe it wasn't a prophet. Maybe it was some kind of other um, religious accoutrement that you thought would secure uh, your salvation or your healing. And so it is, it is just really, really key to begin to say, am I willing to surrender what I thought? That is one of the first, um, I, I think, foundational breakthroughs when I um, became a part of the conservatory that I realized the inflexibility will hold up the manifestation of healing. And so, uh, you know, it was interesting because when I looked up uh, <laughs> what Naaman said, he actually said, you know what? 
Not only am I offended that the prophet didn't come and lay hands on me for me to receive my healing from this skin disease, but I'll tell you something else. You had the unmitigated gall <laughs> to then tell me to go dip in the Jordan River seven times. The Jordan River is a dirtier river. You could have named any, you could have named 10 other rivers and you had the nerve to tell me to come and dip myself in the Jordan River. That is dirtier. In other words, he was saying uh, in some ways, because if you notice in the beginning, it said he, he was a leper, but it said he was also a noble man. And the nuances of life are very fascinating to me. And they continue to be as I live my journey. The nuances of life of how in one area, it says he was a noble man, but in another area, he had this problem. It's really interesting how we can be ministers, quote unquote, or we can be, you know, people can be pastors, but in some area of your life that there, there seems to be some type of a challenge or a crippling. Uh, but I think how we respond to that is, is really where we uh, agree with the healing that, that Christ has said is ours. And so again, John 15 and three says, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. I wanna draw the comparison between, we're reading Naaman's, but it's important that we make the connection now to the practicalities of what this has to do with your life through the finished work of Christ. Okay, and so uh, our second point here, as I began to reflect on Naaman, I realized something. I don't think that the greatest miracle was actually his physical healing. I believe that the greatest miracle for Naaman, which strangely the scripture didn't even mention, was his renewed mind. The, the gift of, of being able to say, you know what? I thought that way, but I'm not gonna think that way anymore. Oh, okay, I thought that's how God would come through. I was angry with God for a little while. But you know what? Maybe God is not who I thought he was in that sense. Maybe I have limited God. Maybe, maybe in some senses I have created a God of my own imagination. The ability uh, and the gift to choose again is where I think the greatest miracle happened as it relates to this particular passage. And I also believe that that is where the greatest miracle will happen for you. And so again, the greatest miracle was not his physical healing, it was his renewed mind. And so I'm gonna screen share again to show you, we're, now we're looking at verses 13 and 14, because the reality is the greatest miracle happened between the scriptures in the blank spaces. Okay, you see him being offended at the way his healing would come. And then you see the servants coming to him humbly and saying, sir, if, if, if he told you to do something harder than this, you would have done it. So what's the problem? And then the scripture says, so Naaman humbled himself and he went to the Jordan River and his skin was made like that of a child. And so I, I find it very interesting because the scriptures, the, the breakthrough um, for Naaman uh, in, in this is in the blank spaces where there is no scripture actually. It's somewhere in between verse 13 and 14 where there's nothing written there. Uh, and I believe that that was the same thing that happened actually with the man at the pool of Bethesda uh, because I, I believe, and this is not a statement about blindness in general, by the way, I'm just talking about the man at the pool, the pool of Bethesda. I do believe that um, there was a crippling of his mind. And so the greatest miracle was not that he picked up his mat and walked. The greatest miracle was the breakthrough and the ability to get up again. The, the ability to say, you know what? I thought I needed a prophet to lay hands on me. I thought I needed a prophetic word. I thought that it had to look this way, but perhaps there's a better way. And so before I pull this up, the question becomes, are you willing to change your mind? And it's not gonna be helpful for us today for us to say, oh yeah, I agree. And then we do nothing with it. It's very, very important that we're able to listen to this, meditate on this, and then take it back to our lives and say, where in my life, and maybe I view my healing inflexibly. I'll give you an example in my own life with my own mental health struggles before. You know, through my struggles, I realized one thing overcoming looks differently than what I had in mind. And I hope this blesses you because uh, for a long time in my mental health journey, I thought that overcoming looks like, you know, I'm a, I'm a word girl. So I love words. Uh, surprise, surprise. And 
I thought that overcoming defined in my life looked one way. And you know what that way was? That one way was overcoming. If it were in a dictionary, in my mind, this is how it would look to remove from my presence. But all of the sudden, as I began to say, I thought, maybe I thought wrong. Overcoming in my mental health journey became redefined to now be, not to mean removed from my presence. Overcoming now means God is with me. Come on, y'all. God is with you. And what if the whole time we're thinking that overcoming looks like we, um, you know, it's no longer with us when God was saying, no, the whole time overcoming meant that I'm with you, not that it's not with you, that I am with you. What if, what if that is, and so when, when, when this really started to fill me, it shifted everything. I was able to forgive God with stuff I had been salty about for years. I was able to, and you know what? I'm not some special case. You can too. And so this is only about what if you have another thought? Can you all put in the chat, have another thought? You can have another thought. And so it, let me just say this. This is another point before we spring and share so I can show you something. Uh, I, I, I hear this. Having another thought doesn't make you inferior. Having another thought doesn't make you inferior. And I think that the problem is that we, some of us have connected our identity so tightly to what we thought. So, so, so tightly to how we thought our journey would look. So tightly to um, the God of our ideation. That when the Lord says, actually, that's not how I'm not going to move. That's not how I plan to move. <laughs> then we are personally offended and we feel that our identity is threatened. I said to the Lord, you, you have threatened my identity <laughs> until I realized uh, the creator gave me my identity. So some, something ain't adding up because if I'm accusing God of threatening my identity and he gave me my identity, then evidently I need to have another thought. And it can feel like that we're so trapped in this paradigm. Anyway, for the sake of time, let me just move on. I just want to screen share again. Okay. Right. Where is it? Here we go. All right. So remember when I was talking about between verses uh, 13 and 14, something happened. Then his servants approached him and said, my father, if the prophet had told you to do some great heroic or hard thing, would you not have done it? How much more than when he says to you, wash and be clean? And somewhere between that ending and verse 14 beginning, he had another thought. And the Bible says he went down and plunged himself into the Jordan seven times and his flesh was restored like a child. Let's see what um, between verses 13 and 14, this one says. All right. Yeah, same thing. Why is it difficult for you to follow his simple instructions when he tells you bathe yourself in the Jordan River and be cleansed? He had another thought. And the Bible says Naaman swallowed his pride and walked himself to that Jordan River and washed himself seven times. And um, one of the other points here, look at this, y'all, next to it. It says, there the miracle occurred. But what I want to submit to you tonight for your next point is that when it says, there the miracle occurred, a strange thought came to me. Where is there? And I began to realize that there was not talking about a geographic location. There was talking about when he had another thought. So I'm here to prophesy to you that in the place where you have another thought, there that your miracle will occur. So in the space where he had another thought, it occurred. It wasn't about what was going on on the outside, folks. It was about the courage to say, I'm going to think again. I'm going to think again. And so, um, you know, at the end of the day, the question that I want to pose before you tonight is, are, we in, are you insulted by what you may need right now? Are you, are you, and when I say you, I really mean me too. Are we insulted 
by what we may need right now. And I'm gonna make it practical in a second because to me, that's really important. Are, are you offended? Are you angry with the steps you need to take? Uh, are you offended with the very process to align with your healing? And so the process of dipping in that particular pool offended Naaman. After all, he was a king who helped, you know, who helped, you know, Syria help the army, you know, be defeated or whatever. And so the process of dipping in that particular pool offended Naaman uh, because the others he compared it to were cleaner. And this is another point that I want to really bring home today. And maybe you can think about it this week, like I will. Some notice that Naaman was offended after he compared what his instructions were to the other pools that he thought was cleaner. And so the point here is that when we compare our process to others, our hearts become offended at the uniqueness of our own process that may be, that may be necessary to walk out our own healing. Back to the example I gave earlier, why is it that when me and Sister Watermelon prayed at the same time, she received a miraculous healing and I had to walk my thing out. Matter of fact, my life crumbled apart even more than that after that. My health deteriorated after that. So I became offended at that particular time in my life be, by, by my own healing journey. Isn't that something? Are you offended at the uniqueness of your own process to walk out your own healing? You know, it, it, it's tough. It, it, it was tough for me to admit that. But at some point, you know, and if I'm going to have another thought, I have to humble myself and say these things. Now, this is what the irony of this whole thing is. We have two more points. This was the irony. When I was in religion, isn't it interesting that I wasn't offended by rolling on the floor, shouting three times, slapping my neighbor? So the question becomes, then why am I offended now when God tells me now you need to clean up your diet, Dominique? Let's get practical, folks. If I'm not offended slapping somebody's wig off because we was all running around the church, but yet I, I'm offended when God says, now you need to make new food choices, Dominique. Why is that? These are the things we need to think about. Are we insulted by the fact that maybe we need mental health medications for the time being? Now, I'm not advocating that. I'm just, just giving some examples. Are we insulted by the medications we need temporarily? Are we insulted by the instructions that the Holy Spirit has granted us to see physical healing? This is applicable to all the areas of our life. Am I offended by what is required? I'm, I'm reminded, not to get too off track, but I'm reminded, I believe it was, why do I feel like it was Cain and Abel? Anyway, the, the Lord said, um, and don't get legalistic on me here. This is not the, the purpose of this, but Cain and Abel had, uh, the Lord said to Cain, I think, if you did right, would you not be accepted? So we're already accepted because of the finished work. But the point of me saying that is, in other words, translation to new covenant, if you, if you, if you did, you know, what, what made wise choices, would you not, you know, would you not experience a, a, a greater quality of life? This is not a condemnation about ill health because we know that that's not the case with everyone. But the point here that I'm trying to make is, are there choices that I can make to improve my situation? That's the point. Even if I can't control the fact that, you know, I received this diagnosis or that diagnosis, what is my response to that? And even in my mental health struggles, and I'm not assuming this is the same for everyone, I'm just sharing my, my, my own, is that somewhere in between what I perceived as I can't think clearly in this moment at that particular time in my life, it was crazy because there was moments of grace allotted to me that if I responded correctly to those moments, it would shift the other moments. And so are there choices I can make to improve my situation? Now, the, for, before we hit these last two points, I just want to say that, that, you know, his healing came by him, you know, following the instructions and, and dipping in the Jordan River seven times, you know. But what occurred to me is that our third scripture, John 4 and 24, says that out of our belly shall flow streams and rivers of living waters. 
And so what I, one of the things that I believe Holy Spirit wants to uh, share with us is that we don't have to go dip in the water. The living waters are inside of us. We don't have to go dip in the water. The living waters are within us. So whereas he went for his healing on the um, outside, the, the, the living water lives within us. And I also think um, that there's some kind of depiction between old covenant and new covenant there because, because the, the uh, law was lesser than um, Hebrews talks about that. The law was lesser than, this is the better covenant, the better way. And he was complaining because the Jordan River was not, you know, was not necessarily as clean as some of the other rivers. But I think that it's actually foreshadowing the new covenant, the better way when the living water will be on the inside of, uh, on the inside of us. And so um, next point. And, and you know what, just for a second, I just declare and decree and prophesy upon our lives here that there is a grace allotted to us to release what we had in mind and how we thought our journey would look and to just align with, with what's been, um, to agree and align with our healing. And so I just want to give a shout out real quick in verse 13, 14 to, to the servants, because the servants are the one who basically said in a humble way, look, uh, I don't understand. If the, if the man of God had told you to do something heroic, you wouldn't have had an issue with that. But if he's telling you to do this simple thing, why can't you do it? I th don't you thank God for people around us that will push us forward to apprehend our own healing? And so this is the reason why I'm so thankful for this community uh, because it's so critical. The difference between name and apprehending his healing or not was the people around him. And so I just thank God for the conservatory for that reason. And so again, uh, take note as well of how they approached him. Notice that um, the, these servants didn't approach him haughtily the scripture takes the time to tell us that the servants humbly approached him and said this. And so, you know, this is not about being a, a servant in, in that sense, in terms of that particular scripture. Just catch on here. The point, the point is, though, is that, you know, even when we are apprehending, um, encouraging our fellow brothers and sisters and things to, to, to move forward. Go ahead, make the wise choices. What are the practical things that, that maybe you can make a choice in now? Or maybe it's not even about doing something. Maybe the question just becomes, do you believe? And I wanted to make sure to share that part because I thought that the statement that the servants made to Naaman was so key because they said, if, if, if he would have said do something great, you wouldn't have had a problem, but he told you to do something simple. Well, when we press that under the new covenant, what is, what is, what is God saying to us? God is saying the simple thing is to believe. The simple thing is to know that my work is finished. Why, why are we trying to do all these other antics and extra stuff when you don't have a problem doing those, but this is a simple thing. The question is, do you really wanna be made whole? The question is, do you believe? Do you wanna be well? That's the question, that's the simple thing. And it's simple because the work has been finished by Christ. And so um, the last point for today, is uh, I, re I really, really like poetry. And, um, you know, one of my favorite poets, and I'm not advertising him or anything, I'm just, I'm just saying, I gotta get credit here. The last point is actually a short quote, it's by Mark Nepo. And, I, and I, I really hope that it touches you like it did me. The quote simply says, what opens us is never as important as what it opens. What opens us is never as important as what it opens. Now, hopefully it goes without saying that we're not over here saying that God caused our infirmity. We're not saying that it was God's will for Naaman or you and me to, to, to struggle with mental health or have different issues nor am I trying to minimize your experience. But I think there's something to be uncovered here 
that whereas Naaman thought he was coming to be healed from leprosy, he was actually coming to renew his mind and he didn't even know it. And so what, what opens us, what opens you may be your struggle with mental health. What opens me may have been a, a, my, a physical infirmity. What opens us all is different. But the point, we're not trying to deify what opened us. The point that I'm making here is, what is it pointing to? What has this experience, what has changed in your mind opened up in you through the power of the Holy Spirit? What opens us is never as important as what it opens. Um, for me, the, the um, struggles and things of name it and claim it, blab it and grab it. Anyway, shall we continue? You all get it. Who's been in, well, who's been in certain denominations? Okay, you know confess and digress, praise the Lord. Uh, and so the point is here is that th the reason why religion, religion was the conduit that was used. Uh, and I'm at this place right now, I am my learning and growing and I have a far, a long ways to go. But the point is, is that what opened me, which was, you know, different things like religion and stuff, is not as important as what it opened. I began to, to, to long to know that which is true. Long is an understatement, folks. I was downright desperate, okay? And so um, that's a different perspective. And it causes us to shift our focus from the thing that we think hurt us and say, what did this open in my life though, in my mind? Uh, and so in conclusion, um, I want to make sure to leave this with you here. Like I said to you, there, the miracle occurred. There wasn't talking about the river. There was referring to the place of his changed and renewed mind. The space where our, okay, this isn't last thing. The space where our mind renews is where the real miracle occurs. The space where our mind renews is where the real miracle occurs. And so um, I'm going to just say a few lines about the renewed mind, and then that is it. And then we'll open it up for questions. The renewed mind is the divine mind of Christ expressing itself within our daily realities. The, the hope of the renewed mind, and this is really important, the hope of the renewed mind and what the renewed mind produces it's not found in a particular circumstantial outcome. It's not based upon whether I see this healing and on this side or not. But the renewed mind does grant us hope about God's faithfulness no matter what. The renewed mind changes everything around us by first shifting the ground within us. The renewed mind is when the eternal affects the internal, which shifts the external. The renewed mind is when the eternal affects the internal, which shifts the external. And so I'm just gonna end with that. And um, I just wanna encourage you tonight to have another thought. And so I just wanna declare and decree in Jesus name um, with you, that we just release our own souls from the anger, unforgiveness, bitterness, and rage from our story, our process, our journey looking differently than what we had in mind. I prophesy, declare, and decree that we free ourselves from false expectation and the parameters that we put up uh, concerning who we thought Christ would be to us and what that would look like more importantly. I just declare and decree that we open ourselves to the mind of Christ within us. And I even have been sensing that there is divine strategy that God wants to release to some of us concerning our healing. Now, th there, there is a, a, a wisdom in choices. I'm not saying that in every second you turn, you have to hear the Lord saying, eat that chicken leg, don't eat the chicken leg. But the point is, is that there are times where God will give us a divine strategy. And if you want to press name and story under the new covenant, let's just say he was given a divine strategy. 
And so I just thank God even now for the wisdom of God and the mind of Christ that is within us concerning our healing. May we not resent the process, Lord, that you are taking us on. We release and we receive in Jesus' name. So that's it, Minister Sam. Thank you so, so, so much, Dominique. Oh my goodness. Somebody called the fire.